Who doesn't love prototypes? Let's talk about this ultra rare EVT iPad. Let's jump into the exterior. On the back, you can see this looks pretty different from your mom's iPad in your closet. You've got this awesome Apple development team sticker with the asset number and a handy dandy little barcode to scan it in. You've also got the asset number and beautiful font engraved on the back as well as your more standard iPad things. And then you got this weird little boxy square boy around the Apple logo. So this actually does have a purpose. While it may look like this abomination of boxes and squares on the back, it's actually a QR code per se. From what I've been told by Apple engineers who worked on the iPad in a lot of earlier products, this was actually Apple's solution to early asset tracking. Because if you go to newer devices, they all have QR codes typically engraved along the side of the phone. And in 2010, that technology wasn't really around. So they developed this sort of asset tag QR code like thing that apparently their internal system can extrapolate data from. So Apple, if you're watching, feel free to run my little QR code and see whose iPad this is. If we jump around to the other side, you can see a number of engravings on the screen. This is actually the asset number from the back in three locations. This third location actually correlates to where an additional dock port could have been on some of the dual dock iPad prototypes. The rarity of this iPad is further compounded by the fact it's a cellular model, as you can see from the SIM card tray here, as well as the massive antenna band on it. You know, this is kind of like an early notch. If we jump around to the front, let's go ahead and turn it on and look at the software. As we can see, we get a boot logo. It's just the generic early iOS boot logo. We also have the verbose boot on the right half of the display, and now we're in. We've got a beautiful little confidential and proprietary, if found, please contact, and a Apple phone number. Now I have good news and bad news about the iOS build this iPad is running. The good news is it is an internal build of iOS, which is pretty rare on these early iPads. The bad news is it's been updated to iOS 5.0. Now, it's kind of sad it's not on its original version of internal iOS. However, it means once we jump inside, there are loads of different apps that wouldn't have been present on, let's say, an iOS 3 build. So let's start in settings. If we scroll all the way down, we've got the awesome carrier settings pane, which just has a lot of carrier specific testing because you know, your 3G iPad was the pinnacle of 2010 technology. We've even got internal settings, much akin to modern day debug menus on new internal builds of iOS and similar to my video on a prototype iPhone 4. We have features to allow sensitive UI for new features in development. You've got Flytrap for debugging. You have springboard settings where you can enable new springboard system options. You have the wonderful, this switch is not for you for the legal text on the lock screen. We're just gonna turn that off again. And if we keep going, there's just a multitude of debug settings. CoreOS will show us the hardware model, the kernel version absurdly early iBoot version of 1200, the silicon of development, the ECID, and the config being FTA main. If I recall correctly, this was assembled in like week 19 of 2010, me being quite early on in the whole process. If you keep going down, it's just more and more debug settings. If we go back to the home screen, we can see lots and lots of debug apps. Ironically, there is VigCam, which is a debug camera app, but as we know, the iPad doesn't have a camera, but you know, it's just there in case you want it. You've got Blackjack in case, you know, you're really feeling like you want to play a card game on Game Center. Ooh, we're an unauthenticated user. Another camera app, Memory Muncher is a memory testing app that will just fill up the RAM on the iPad at a rate of one megabyte every 75 seconds until the app crashes. As you can see, it's actually formatted a little weirdly where the GUI takes up the left-hand portion of the display and then you've got text in the middle. This is quite common on these early builds as the iPad builds and the 3GS builds share a number of similarities where you can actually get some of these to run on the 3GS. If we toggle it on, as you will see, it'll start to fill up RAM. We can increase the size and the rate. So now it's just gonna fill it up until it crashes and it's crashed. Now we're back at the home screen. 
We've got NetGauge, which is a speed test app. You've got some onboarding tests. This is an app for PDF testing. Scouting has got to be one of the coolest apps. Again, it's formatted a little weirdly because it's meant for the 3GS, but you have more maps of Infinite Loop. You want to go to the AT Lab. You want to go to the Santos Lab. It's all here to help you get around. Just imagine being an Apple engineer having to stare at this tiny little two inch by three inch area of your massive iPad to try and get around Infinite Loop. Ooh, those must have been some horrid days. You've got Tanks, our favorite game center testing app. We can start a match. Again, formatted quite weirdly for the 3GS size. Now, unfortunately, this isn't Tanks HD, so it's not full screen. So if we hop back to Tanks HD, it's, we've got the full screen app. We can even go into options and start a single player tanks match. Now, unfortunately, tanks is a little buggy and because it's single player, there isn't a lot to do. But as I said, this is just an early game center testing app that would have been used partially to test the performance of the iPad, as well as leaderboard functionality and multiplayer functionality on game center. If you've got tanks, let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to play a match with you. You've got texture sizer for keyboard testing. You have spinning iPhone, which is a GPU testing app quite cool this app is actually present on devices still to the modern day as you can see it runs horribly slow on the ipad due to its age and somewhat slow chip but it runs nonetheless at a glorious one frame a second on the last page we have touch fighter which is another game testing app wi-fi testing twitter tester which is another sort of obviously tweet testing app wi-fi survey Wi-Fi for real, Word for Word and ZoomPam, which are more network related testing apps. And that's about it. It's a pretty standard internal build for the time. However, quite unique is anything from the iOS 4 to 6 era isn't really known a whole lot about with internal builds. If you really want an app by app explanation of every app on here, feel free to let me know and I could make a really long video about that. So let's go ahead and jump into the internals because this iPad does have some cool things hiding on the inside. After having cracked it open, we're left with two main pieces, the iPad and the display panel. If we look at the panel on the left, we can see it has a sticker for some part tracking as well as the actual part information barcode itself. We even have a little bit of a cutout here for what would have been that additional dock connector on the iPad. The display itself isn't too horribly interesting, so let's jump back to the iPad. The battery, as you can see, is actually a DVT battery that started to expand a little bit, which is unfortunately pretty common with these prototype batteries. We've got the cellular modem over here, and if we pry off the heat shield covering the SOC, we can see we have a more or less unlabeled A-series chip. There is a tiny little Apple logo on it, but it's not like the Apple with the A, it's just got a whole bunch of text on the chip. That is incredibly common among these early devices and I always love to see it. We've got the SIM card tray assembly and its other little cellular bits. The awesome thing about this iPad is it actually has the connector here for what would be the dual dock assembly. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say dual dock, Apple actually prototyped these first gen iPads. So obviously you could have the docking port in the portrait orientation, but you would have a docking port in the landscape orientation. So you could dock your iPad like this and you could have it as almost more of a media center. It's why in some of the early builds of iOS for these first gen iPads, you had the ability to have it as kind of a photo portrait that would just change through photos over time. We've got a speaker assembly down here, and then you have the charge port flex that runs over the batteries. Overall, it's a really simple interior. It's honestly kind of amazing to me how much space these iPads have on the inside on the inside because iPads today have virtually no space. You would not have this dead space at all. And we've got these beautiful CNC lines from the manufacturing of the case. Overall, it's really simple on the inside, but beautiful nonetheless and amazing with that unlabeled chip. 
This has been a deep dive into one of the earliest and in my opinion, coolest prototypes in my collection. I love these early first generation products and it's awesome to see how far Apple's come from something like this. Let me know what you wanna see next in the comments below and be sure to like and subscribe for more content.